Hi, my name is Rhea Somerville and this is Bunker. So over the last few weeks I've been talking about some various places and things that you can go to around Aotearoa to witness and experience Japanese culture. And last week I was discussing Featherston with a man named Mark Pacey who is a archivist at the Wairarapa Archives and has been researching New Zealand's military history for a decent amount of time. And Mark's actually working on a book about Featherston at the moment, but briefly during that episode we talked about the art and objects that you can find at Featherston Heritage Museum that were actually created by Japanese prisoners of war. And so I want to talk today about that. And so if you are just tuning in on this episode, I would go back and listen to the Featherston episode just to get some history behind what went down at the Featherston prisoner of war camp and why there were so many Japanese prisoners of war in New Zealand creating art at that time. So first I guess we should talk about where Featherston Heritage Museum even is. And you've got a couple of options to get to the museum. So if you're visiting from Wellington, it's about an hour drive. But if you don't have a car and you want to visit the museum, you can access it by taking the train from Wellington Station and getting off in Featherston. The museum is actually on the main street, so you won't miss it. And across the road is a memorial for the New Zealand soldiers who were in the wars. There's also a memorial up the road, a Sakura Garden, which the people of Featherston put up to honour the lives that were lost during the shooting that happened at the prisoner of war camp. Now, if you're at the memorial, which is just up the road from the Featherston Township, across the road from there is actually the site where the camp was. And there are some ruins still on the site of foundations of buildings and things like that, but it is currently privately owned, so it's not accessible for people to go and have a look at, which is a bit of a shame because the history of the site, I think, is quite important to New Zealand. And... Not having it accessible to the public is a bit of a shame. It would be nice if they had made it like a memorial park or something like that. But for now, it is privately owned. Not to say that it may not eventually come back into public hands at some point. When we visited Featherston, I was lucky enough to talk with Neil Francis, who is a historian in the area of Featherston. And he helps the museums occasionally with school groups and tour groups and so he gave me a little bit of a rundown of the site we went and looked at the private land from the road obviously because you're not allowed on the land and he gave us a bit of a rundown of where the buildings would have been the prisoner of war camp and the training camp and then we went with him to have a look in the museum as well Although the land was retained by the New Zealand military for a fairly long amount of time, it was sold in around 1960 or 70 and has been passing through her private hands since then. But yeah, it was used quite often as the training site for military and then obviously was used in World War II as a prisoner of war camp. The site itself is protected by Heritage New Zealand, so that means that because of the historical significance, you're not actually allowed to break ground on the land anymore. This means that even if you're a private owner, you're not allowed to dig down into the ground. So you can cut a tree down, but you're not allowed to dig up the roots. And this is because there are archaeological significant material, which may be under the ground, that could be disrupted if somebody were to put down a foundation or something along those lines. Me and Neil did discuss that he also felt the land should be owned publicly and that it would have been a really good site for a museum, a memorial, a heritage park, anything like that. And I think that there are a lot of people in the Featherston area who probably feel the same way. And if you go to the side of the road that has the memorial, there's a car park and a sign talking about the camp and things like that. That was actually the site on which... 
the shops and churches and things like that existed during World War One for the soldiers to attend. So the whole site was kind of a military township. The Memorial Garden is also known as the Peace Gardens and 68 cherry trees were planted to memorialize the lives that were lost during the Featherston incident, which is the name of the shooting which occurred in the prisoner of war camp. So when we were visiting, it was September, but it was very cold and the blossoms weren't quite out yet. But I feel like it would be a great time of year to go and visit the gardens during spring when all the cherry blossoms are in full bloom. In Japan, at the changing of season from winter to spring, there's a tradition known as hanami. Uh, hana meaning flower and mi meaning look or to view. And so hanami is when people go to look at the cherry blossoms in view at the start of spring. And I think that Featherston, with this memorial garden, would be a really beautiful place to hold hanami and remember the lives lost but also the growth that's occurred since World War II. Now New Zealand writer Vincent O'Sullivan actually reviewed the book Beyond Death and Dishonor One Japanese at War in New Zealand by Michiharu Shinya and in that he discussed the Japanese fight to have a peace garden in Featherston. This was campaigned by Adachi who was a prisoner in the camp and was a, a military man. And O'Sullivan writes that Adachi's long campaign to establish a memorial garden near Featherston was snookered even quite recently by the RSA. A great pity, the proposed peace garden would not for a moment have let the Japanese off the hook for their wartime atrocities but it would have conceded how the facts of the future are now in other hands. And I think that this garden really is a representation of that in terms of it's not about Japanese versus New Zealand. It was more about moving on from what had happened in the war. You'll also find in the garden a plaque with a haiku on it by Basho. And this reads, Behold the summer grass all that remains of the dreams of warriors. Another plaque at the site reads, in memory of 68 servicemen who died here in World War II. The memorial has been subject to a lot of vandalism and one of those acts of vandalism was actually scratching out the English translations on the plaque donated by the Japanese embassy. And other vandalism included the ripping out of the cherry trees when they were first planted. But in the following decades, it has become less likely and less subject to vandalism. Like I said, the Featherstone RSA was really opposed to the Memorial Garden for quite a long time. And so it did take a while until it was erected. And so a fight that had been ensuing for the Memorial Garden from the 1970s started to make process in 2000 when a Japanese choir came to perform in Featherston and they received a standing ovation from the people who attended the concert. It was a first since the war for Japanese and non-Japanese to have a non-military experience together and the move to make the garden was actually passed when they decided to drop the word peace from the garden making it just a garden not a peace garden and that seemed to win over a few of the RSA members. It was said that some of the RSA members were always going to be dead against it and some didn't mind and some were pro but eventually the motion was passed and the garden was able to be made. In 2001 the garden was finally built and 
yes it suffered some vandalism but now it's standing and the trees are very healthy they're getting so big that they're touching each other and despite it having had to drop the word peace initially it's been called the peace gardens ever since anyway and the choir actually still tours quite often and they come and visit Featherston although I imagine in the last few years they haven't been able to and I think that that's quite nice to know that it is a place in which Japanese people are finding some some peace and finding a point of connection in New Zealand as well now in the last episode when I was talking with Mark he told me about the piece that he bought on Trade Me that was made by a Japanese prisoner of war and the plaque that Mark has is very similar to the ones which you'll find in the Heritage Museum. They're interesting objects, they're very unique because there aren't very many situations in which there are objects made by Japanese people using New Zealand native materials. So a lot of the wood that's used is native woods like Rimu and the prisoners also used native materials such as power shell and things like that which are inlaid into the wood. Visiting the museum, every time I've gone I have been going there for a project or for work and so it's always been able to be opened for me by somebody but it is open on a regular basis mainly on the weekends I believe and mainly in summer and if there was a specific reason that you wanted to visit such as taking a school group or a tour group you can reach out to the museum and they can open specifically for those purposes as well it is a very sweet and quite small local museum and back in the day there used to be this New Zealand TV show called Heritage Rescue and on the show a woman named Bridget Gallagher would go to a different heritage site in New Zealand with her team of professional <laughs> redecorators and things like that and revamp museum spaces for small collections and underfunded institutions which to be honest is probably my dream job but you know that's for another time and so back in the day Featherston was on Heritage Rescue and so it did get a fairly decent revamp particularly its display methods so lots of information panels were made as well as high quality glass vitrines and display cabinets so it has a really well presented collection which is something I would notice as a museums graduate a section of the museum is dedicated to World War I and a section is dedicated to Featherston's history. So about a third of the space is dedicated to the history of the prisoner of war camp and the objects that the prisoners made while they were interned there. So just like any museum you'll see narratives about the prisoners on the walls. There's a lot of photography as well of the prisoners in their camps which Mark and I did talk a little bit about in the previous episode and you'll see the kind of relationships captured between the prisoners and the guards while they were at the camp. There's also drawings, there's poetry, a small table which was made by one of the prisoners and me and Mark actually talked about how prisoners face a lot of boredom when they're in camps and so the prisoners obviously took it upon themselves to be entertained they created dominoes, chess, mahjong, cards there's also a dictionary which is made on cigarette packaging which translates Japanese to English there's a book which has everybody's name and occupation in it all these kinds of things which would have been used in everyday life Alongside the things that they made for their own personal use, they were also commissioned to make things by some of the guards. And this would normally be in exchange for cigarettes or the internment camp currency. And this was objects such as artworks, carved figurines. It also included plaques like the one that Mark owns 
and dress canes, which is what one of the lieutenants had carved. I think some of my favourite things are the wooden carvings, which have also been painted. And these bear resemblance to Japanese woodblock prints or ukiyo-e. However, instead of being printed, it is a wooden relief carving. And by that I mean it's a flat surface which has been carved to create the peaks and valleys to create the picture. So there's depictions of Mount Fuji and geisha and bridges and things like that. And then these have been painted over, likely with dried up old paints and also industrial paints which would have been used to paint the buildings and those types of things at the camp. I also mentioned the dress canes which were carved and one of the lieutenants noticed that the Japanese would take a piece of number eight wire and use two stones to flatten it out so that they could make like a sharp wire for cutting and using as a saw and then they would use that to help to carve the wood and make details and so some of these canes that are on display were actually made using number eight wire to carve the detail which is quite amazing when you look at the delicacy and minute patterns and things which are carved into the works. As Mark also said in regards to his plaque from the last episode, the prisoners used a nail but instead of using the pointed end they would use the round head and hit the pointed end with a rock or something and by doing that they would create a fish scale like pattern on the wood and it was a way of decorating and creating a design on the things that they were carving. This kind of imaginative process is quite unique and interesting and really only something you would find for people who are somewhere where they have no access to regular tools and that's what makes these objects so unique. So there's not really any way for me to explain these objects in any more detail because I don't really think that the energy and fascinating aspects of the works really translate over voice so I would just encourage people to visit this topic is really special to me I've been working with aspects of Featherston and the Heritage Museum and the collection for a few years just casually and I think the thing that really got me the most was nobody knowing that it had happened and I think that that in itself is what has made it even more important that these stories are shared. Because if you tell people that there was a prisoner of war camp in New Zealand during World War II, so many of us don't even know that it existed. I didn't, and I'm half Japanese. And I think that this is a story that is important to know it's a huge part of Aotearoa's history and is a huge part of the history of the war. I'm really grateful that the Heritage Museum is there and that they're able to stay open and display these objects which are 100% unique for the time period, the materials and the creators. It means that there is nothing else like this anywhere else in the world. These were created in a very specific circumstance and a very specific time and they hold a very specific social history within them. And it's really important that they're protected and I think it's really important that people know about this history. And so I would really, really encourage anybody who's interested in military history, Japanese culture, Japanese history, Aotearoa's history, all of these things. If you have any interest in these, I think you'll find Featherston Heritage Museum an interesting place to visit. I will 
talk to you guys again soon with another episode of Bunker. And I just want to shout out to the team who work at Featherston Heritage Museum as volunteers. It is a volunteer run space. It is run by people in the community who think that it is holding something really important. And so shout out to them for continuing to keep the place going. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.